Now, when we talk about rocks, we talk about the source of the rock material, the parent components of the rock, the rock forming process, and the resultant rock. Here we have a standard schematic of a cross section of a subduction zone with the associated continental volcanics or island arc volcanics if we're in the Western Pacific. Starting with igneous rocks, we provide the source material by melting rocks in the hot, deep crust and the upper mantle. This includes material that gets pushed down a subduction zone, as seen here. The result is, in the rock forming process, the crystallization or the solidification of magma if it's within the earth or lava at the earth's surface. The result is, if it's deep seated crystallization, down in the Earth's crust, and it takes a long time, you get a coarsely crystallized granite, or a coarsely crystalline granite, as seen here. So this requires time. Sedimentary rocks can be sourced from the weathering and erosion of rocks exposed at the surface, that material in the form of grains or clasts, in geologic terminology, is going to slide down slope until it reaches a resting point and that resting point can result in sedimentary rock forming here near the surface or the sedimentary rock forming further down in where it's hotter and in that case the rock is more likely to consist of grains that are fused together as a function of heat and chemistry. So we weather material at the surface, we either produce solid clasts or dissolved ions which go into water and ultimately the deposition, burial, and lithification that occurs is going to be the result, again, of time, pressure, and chemistry. The result could be a cross laminated sandstone. So in this case, the sand grains were organized either by wind or water. And from the looks of this, most likely water. And eventually cement grew between the grains, fusing them together into this cross laminated sandstone. When we get to metamorphic rocks, we're talking about rocks under high temperatures and pressures in the deep crust and upper mantle. That's not always the case. We can produce metamorphic rock right at the surface as well and see some examples of that in coming lectures. The rock forming process is the recrystallization in the solid state of new minerals. By definition, a metamorphic rock is formed without reaching the melting phase. So we're heating up rocks like this or this under pressure with some fluids, most likely, and the result is a recrystallization. The minerals are going to reform themselves. And in this case, they're going to reform themselves in some kind of laminar fashion with some lineation here. And that implies there's pressure coming from this direction and pressure coming from this direction. So these get squished and reformed to basically fall in line in the form of a gneiss. Importantly, we can tell fairly quickly, oftentimes, whether a rock is igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic by the component minerals. We start out with a very common mineral, quartz, that's found regularly in igneous rocks, in most igneous rocks. Because it's found in most igneous rocks, it ends up as the grains left behind that end up in sedimentary rocks as well. So just finding quartz in a rock doesn't mean you can tell whether it's igneous or sedimentary because quartz is also a metamorphic mineral, it appears that it's going to be useless in determining whether a rock is igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic, its presence or absence. Now with feldspar, we can have feldspars present in igneous rocks. We can also have, in the case of an arcos kind of sedimentary rock, a considerable amount of feldspar. And feldspar is common in metamorphic rocks as well. So again, we got to toss that out. Now, some of these feldspars are going to weather and convert into clay minerals. So the presence of clay minerals provides some clue as to what the precursor mineralogy was. Micas, commonly found in igneous rocks. They're not listed here, but they're commonly found in sedimentary rocks and commonly found in metamorphic rocks. So that's not going to help. Pyroxenes are found in igneous rocks. They're not found regularly in sedimentary rocks because they are very reactive. So they weather chemically and physically fairly quickly. So they disappear from the sedimentary record, but they can be reconstituted in a metamorphic rock. Amphiboles, very common in igneous rocks, not common in sedimentary rocks for the same reason 
the pyroxenes aren't common and they're not common in metamorphic rocks either. So if you find amphiboles, that's a pretty good signal that you've got an igneous rock. Olivine only occurs in igneous rock for the same reason these two only occur in igneous rock. It's a high temperature mineral, so it weathers very rapidly at the low temperature conditions at the Earth's surface. Minerals are most stable at the temperatures at which they form. So if you're a high temperature mineral, you're stable at high temperatures. If you're a low temperature mineral, you're stable at low temperatures. If you change those conditions for either one, you make them unstable. As far as sedimentary rocks are concerned, the presence of calcite is a good indicator that sedimentary rock. Dolomite, another good indicator as are gypsum and halite. In metamorphic rocks, some key minerals would be garnet, starlight, and kyanite. And the reason these are key minerals is they're very easy to identify by sight, and they're only found in metamorphic rocks. So if you find one of these, garnet, starlight, or kyanite, it's metamorphic. Here are some examples of starlight crystals. These are twinned crystals, so it's one starlight crystal growing through another starlight crystal. This can occur at two angles most commonly, 90 degrees and 120 degrees. So here we have, again, some examples where the starlight crystals have been isolated from the matrix. This is real. It's not a, a man-made or human-made thing, nor is this. If you take away this matrix, this whitish, grayish material here, you end up with these crystals. You can polish them and do all kinds of gemstone-like things to them. So very distinctive, very common, very indicative of metamorphism. When we talk about igneous rocks, we need to talk about whether they're extrusive igneous rocks forming when magma erupts at the surface, cooling rapidly to either a fine ash or a lava, in both cases having very, very tiny crystals. The most common resulting rock is basalt. It is a very fine-grained rock, or if it cools even more rapidly, it can have a glassy texture, look like glass. Essentially, it is glass. Now here, in the case of an igneous intrusion, we have an intrusive igneous rock forming over a very long period of time. These intrusive igneous rocks occur when molten material crystallizes, usually at depth, and therefore slowly. The result is large crystals, that form during the slow cooling process, lots of time to accumulate the ions that you want as a mineral. And the result is a coarsely grained rock, such as the granite sample shown here. So this rock might have the exact same chemistry as this one. Unlikely, but it's possible. The only difference being this formed over a long period of time, and this formed over an hour or a couple of days or weeks or months. 10, 20 million years, perhaps, a uh, week. Now, constituent minerals in a granite, mentioned this a little bit before, we have a hand specimen here that we've isolated a section from, and now we're going to describe the minerals that are present. We have orthoclase feldspar. That's a potassium-rich feldspar. It's generally pinkish color. These they are all wrong here, but it can also be white or uh, even blue. So again, very common in granites. This would be the orthoclase feldspar. Quartz, again, very, very common in granite. It would be this gray material here. Biotite, also very common. It's going to be dark colored mineral seen here and here and here. Plagioclase feldspar is also very common, are going to be the white grains seen in this cross section. Again, plagioclase can range from white to black, any color in between, even a kind of iridescent bluish color for labradorite, an intermediate plagioclase feldspar. Sedimentary rocks can be a bit more complicated in some ways than igneous rocks. The initial particles are created by weathering, rain falling, frost wedging, 
gravity, rocks bashing into each other, all this is going to result in particles or clasts of material being derived from a precursor rock. This material is going to be transported downhill by erosion, sliding down the slope. Then it can be moved by rivers into either lakes or oceans. Once they reach an open body of water, they're going to be dropped from the river because the motion of the water has decreased. So gravity is going to become dominant in that case, and the material sinks and piles up in layers. So this is where we get our parallel bedding. Now, if the material gets pushed further down and large amounts of material are placed on top, it gets pushed down by the weight of the overlying material. This forces the grains together and they're going to lithify or become rock by compaction and cementation. So a combination of crunching the material together and then fusing it with some kind of cement. The cement can be calcite pretty commonly or quartz or a number of other things, but usually it's calcite or quartz. Siliciclastic sediments are made up of deposited particles of sand, silt, and gravel. These sediments are usually going to be the components, the left behind material, the resistant material that makes up granite. Some of the most resistant material is going to be quartz and feldspars. We can also induce precipitation of sediment chemically and biologically. Now, if we simply evaporate seawater, we're going to concentrate the ions that are in this seawater. Eventually, they're going to join up with other ions because there's no water molecules keeping them apart. Or plants and animals can grab the ions they want and build shells. This is a coral that in real life looks kind of like a baked potato. I think that's the species. So most of the carbonate in a coral reef today is actually produced by algae. So the magic word here would be algae. We call coral reefs coral reefs because we see these large forms, sometimes very colorful, and therefore we name it after that. When the real work is being done by little green plants and little chow mein noodley kind of uh, reddish algae. When we get to metamorphic rocks, we have some additional things to consider. Starting out with continental crust, a subduction zone here, as we saw in the, the igneous rock scenario. We have continental lithosphere below that, and then the asthenosphere below that. Remember, this is the weak layer where there's partial melting. So the result is a number of different kinds of metamorphic rock, where we have contact metamorphism, cool rock, touched by hot rock, we get what's called a hornfels. And it's just like you might imagine. It's made up of hornblende and feldspar. Hornblende, this black stuff. Feldspar, this goldish, brownish, greenish stuff. So this is a contact metamorphism. Fairly low pressure, fairly quick cooling because it's near the surface very distinctive appearance, very distinctive texture. An eclogite occurs further down in the crust where we have ultra high pressure. And this is going to be from the overlying material pushing against the underlying material. This ultra high pressure is going to force this characteristic eclogite formation. If the temperatures are a little bit lower, we can have what's known as a mica schist. This is a schist, which consists largely of mica, a very shiny rock. You see some blebs here or nuggets. These are garnets, almost always. If we get to a high pressure, low temperature metamorphic environment, we're going to produce a rock called a blue schist. So here, lots of pressure from the collision of these two plates, one plate here, another plate here pushing against each other, popping up the Himalayas perhaps, this pressure is going to occur in a relatively low temperature portion of the Earth's crust. So the result is a blue schist. So very distinctive textures, very distinctive chemistries that are driven by where the action occurs. 
So when we look at the rock cycle, here we have an example of two continental bodies adjacent to each other with some rifting between. So they're pulling apart slightly. This is going this way. This is going this way. As they pull apart, we have accommodation faulting. The crest is going to drop down. That forms accommodation space that's going to fill with sediment that's derived from these rivers. So these highlands are breaking up physically and chemically, and the products are going into this rift basin. Now we'll start out with rifting and development of a divergent margin within a continent. We can use East Africa as an analog here. Sediment is eroded from the continental interior and deposited in rift basins where they're buried to form sedimentary rocks. In the case of the rift lakes of Africa, Tanganyika, Malawi, very, very deep lakes. Lots of sediment has accumulated over tens of millions of years. That sediment has reached a point where it's being compressed by the overlying material and the grains are being fused together. If this rifting and the spreading continue, we see the development of a new ocean basin. That's what Africa is trying to do in the Great Rift. Magma will rise from the asthenosphere at the mid-ocean ridges and chill to form basalt, which is a common low-pressure igneous rock. So this magma is going to be converted into igneous rock when it reaches the ocean bottom here and cools rapidly. If the subsidence of the continental margin continues, it's going to lead to accumulation of sediment and formation of sedimentary rock during burial. So now we have two passive margins, like the east coast of North America and the western edge of Europe, where sediment is accumulating. In the case of North America, we have huge sedimentary deposits off the east coast wherever there's a river flowing into the Atlantic. In the case of Europe, we have thick sequences of sediment off the coast of Norway that is making Norway rich these days because of the oil that's incorporated in that sediment. If this crest continues to subduct beneath the continent, we will build a volcanic mountain chain. The subducting plate is going to melt as it descends and magma is going to rise from that melting plate and eventually cool to make granitic igneous rocks. So cooling at a much lower rate, much more slowly, is going to result in coarser crystals. We can see them with the naked eye. Further closing of this basin is going to lead to continental collision. And the Himalaya is a good example here. We have the Indian subplate crashing into the Asian plate. And the result is this slow motion car crash is forcing high mountain ranges. Now Everest got bumped up three feet by the Chinese and the Nepalese just recently. So it's now 29,032 feet high. That's up from 29,029 feet, which is a lot easier to memorize. Regardless, this high mountain formation is going to really torture the rocks that are being compressed and heated here. And the result is we're going to form high pressure and high temperature metamorphic rocks. The result is climatically that as we push these rocks up into big mountains, they scrape the moisture out of air. As air rises, it cools. As it cools, it drops precipitation. So the higher these mountains go, the faster they weather back down. What goes up must come down and what goes up fast must come down fast. So there's a constant battle between Mount Everest getting bigger and the jet stream, which causes a lot of the climbing problems for Everest climbers to get stronger and wear that rock down faster. So this weathering is gonna result in loose material, soils and sediment. Erosion is gonna move that off the slope and into the Bengal fan, a huge deposit of sediment off the Southern coast of India. Streams and rivers that transport the sediment away from the collision zones to the oceans are going to move that material as sand and silt. Eventually layers are buried and lithify, forming 
sedimentary rock. Now, one of the reasons we talk about minerals, one of the reasons we're interested in them, is that they are worth a lot of money. They're a valuable commodity to everybody on Earth, whether you know it or not. The types of ore minerals that we find are often found in distinctive types of deposits, such as vein deposits, disseminated deposits, igneous deposits, sedimentary deposits. Starting out with vein deposits, we have deformed country rock. Country rock, something that is neither. Geysers and hot springs, plutonic intrusion here. Uh, so what's happening is we have a sedimentary sequence with some groundwater that's being heated up by this plutonic intrusion. Magma is going to work its way towards the surface because this is less dense than the surrounding material. So it's trying to float up like an ice cube. Same thing going on here, floating up like an ice cube. As it gets closer to the surface, it heats up the groundwater and heating this groundwater causes it to convect. It rises where it reaches the surface as a geyser or hot spring, cooling off. So it's taking all the ions it scoops up here in very hot water, cooling that water off and dropping those ions at the surface. If they're ions of interest like silver and gold and things like that, then it becomes an ore deposit if it's valuable enough. We can see in the case of Yellowstone Park, a large magma body, a mantle plume beneath it. It's driving the formation of carbonate deposits in Mammoth, the Mammoth Hot Springs of Yellowstone. Whereas in the Norris Geyser Basin, the rock that's being intruded by this hot water is silicate rock. So the features that are generated are silicate features as opposed to carbonate features generated when carbonate rock dissolves. So groundwater is going to dissolve metal oxides and sulfides. Heated by the magma, it rises and as it cools, it's going to precipitate metal ores in joints and fractures and nooks and crannies, any space that's available. And here we have an example of a vein deposit. We have quartz with a thin vein of silver. Probably a little bit of silver here, a little bit of silver here. So this would be typical of the type of silver deposits you see in places like Nevada and British Columbia, which happen to be worth a lot of money. In fact, the term the mother load comes from this type of deposit. Now, other types of sulfides have been used for thousands and thousands of years for a variety of reasons. Initially, the mineral cinnabar, which is seen here, a mercuric sulfide or mercury sulfide, very attractive color known as vermilion. It was used to put lines on pottery. The LBK people, the linear band ceramic people, came out of the Czech Republic and moved to the West. These people ultimately became the Celts, so the Irish, the Scots, the Welsh, and they pretty much blended in with the Germanic tribes and so on and so forth. The result is this pottery technology spread across Europe and because it's mercuric sulfide, it turns out to be poisonous. We published a paper a couple years ago on people that were poisoning themselves 5,000 years ago in Portugal, making pottery using this cinnabar. So that's a problem. We only have their bones to analyze for mercury. So we want to know how much mercury they really ingested. And for that, we went to a place where people were worried about precipitation, which is South America. In the Andes, there was a princess there who was more realistically a 15-year-old girl who they marched up to the top of a volcano and killed her. She's known as the Ice Princess now. So her body is perfectly preserved for about 500 years now. She was covered with makeup made out of this mineral and probably colored her hair with the mineral as well. So we're going to recover a couple samples of soft tissue from this mummy to determine the toxicity in her bones compared to the soft tissue so that we can evaluate how far gone the people in Portugal were at about 5,000 years ago from mercury poisoning. Because modern human studies of toxicity don't generally involve bone samples. People are much more willing to give you a, a hair sample than a bone sample. So we're going to try to calibrate the 
mercury poisoning in the ice princess of Cusco to the people of Portugal that were making pottery for trade around Europe 5,000 years ago. When we talk about sulfide minerals coming from vein deposits, we're usually talking about things like galena, a lead sulfide, cinnabar, mercury sulfide, pyrite, an iron sulfide, and sphalerite, a zinc sulfide. Oftentimes these can be associated with each other. So in the case of the viburnum trend in southeastern Missouri, famous for hundreds of years for producing lead and also zinc. There are other such deposits around the world. We can actually trace them. Looking at the concentrations of a number of different lead isotopes, we can determine which mine lead came from through history. If there's a lead deposit in a lake or ice, we can tell who made that deposit. Was it the Romans? Was it the Celts? Was it the Europeans? Was it the Americans? We can figure all that out from looking at the isotopes of these minerals. A dramatic example of an open pit disseminated mine is here. This is the Kennecott Copper Corporation in Bingham Canyon, Utah, located just to the west of Salt Lake City. If you're in Salt Lake City or anywhere within a 30 to 50 mile radius, you can see this. It's a gigantic mountain with the top chopped off flat and they actually dug into the mountain and removed all this material, which is dumped over the side. And again, can be seen for 50 miles, maybe more, maybe a lot more. For scale, these are gigantic trucks. So a person, I don't see a person. This is a car. So imagine a person in this car compared to this space. That's how much material has been removed. In fact, concentration of gold and silver is very, very, very low. But because so much material has been removed, they actually pay for the mining costs just from the extraction of gold and silver. All the rest is copper profit. Copper itself is an important indicator of economic health around the world. When copper prices go up in the stock market, that means business is good around the world. When copper prices go down, maybe things are slowing down internationally in terms of economic health. The minerals that are mined here are chalcopyrite, it's a copper iron sulfide, malachite, which is a copper carbonate, and chalcosite, which is a copper sulfide, another copper sulfide. So these are the minerals that they're after here. And to separate the sulfur from the copper, you use a smelter. And this is what generates the pollution that we see in places like Flin Flon, where the landscape looks like a moon because everything's been killed by the, the smelter. Same around Sudbury, here in Salt Lake City, etc. And we can have igneous deposits of minerals as well. In this case, this is the Stillwater complex in Montana. These are layers of chromite. So layers of chrome minerals, mineral chromite. Here, this dark band, this is very valuable. This formed from a large magma chamber. There's actually circulation in that magma chamber for a very long period of time. As material cooled near the top, it solidified into chromite and it sank to the bottom, to this layer. Other material, feldspars, accumulated on top. And then there was another burst of chromite on top of that, etc., forming this sequence of layers that came out of an igneous setting, a magma setting. Sedimentary deposits include copper, iron, and other metals. Gold, diamonds, and other heavy minerals can form placer deposits or placer deposits which rely on the specific gravity of the mineral relative to other minerals. So gold has a very, very high specific gravity. Therefore, when prospectors used to use pans to pan for gold, they would put sediment from the river or stream in a large metal pan and shake it around to separate the heavy minerals from the light minerals. The lower density minerals could be swooshed off of the pan and what's left behind are the heavy minerals, which would be diamond and gold and a couple other things, things like tin. And um, when I taught field school at the University of Michigan, we took the students to Atlantic City, Wyoming to show them how to pan for gold. And we handed out the pans and 
showed them how to scoop up some sediment, swivel it around, separate the low density minerals from the high density minerals, uh, basically swooshing the low density minerals off, leaving any gold or other heavy minerals behind. So there were a couple inner city kids from Detroit in the class that year. Skip Simmons, one of the instructors from New Orleans, figured he'd liven up the afternoon, put some brass filings in his mouth so the students wouldn't see him doing anything with his hands. And he goes up to a group of these kids and he says, um, oh, you're doing it all wrong. You get more sediment in there. Get it in there. Get it in the pan. Shake it around. Give it a good shake. Come on, shake it. And then students do this. They don't see anything. He goes, come on, you're doing it wrong. And he takes a big scoop of sediment and he spits the filings in without them seeing it and hands it back to them. He goes, now shake it. Shake it, boy. And this kid shakes the pan. He goes, what's that? You got something in there. And the kid looks really closely at the pan. Then he looks at Skip. He says, I don't know. It looks like brass filings. All right, everybody get back in the vans. We're out of here. Thought question for the chapter. Back in the late 1800s, gold miners used to pan for gold by placing sediment from rivers in a pan and filtering water through the pan while swirling the pan's cotton. The miners wanted to be certain that they had found real gold and not pyrite. Why did this method work? What mineral property does the process of panning for gold use? What is another possible method for distinguishing between gold and pyrite? So, why did this method work? Well, we just talked about that. It's the specific gravity. The density of gold forces it to the bottom of the pan. You scrape away the low density material and you have the gold concentrated. Another possible method for distinguishing between gold and pyrite would be what? Well, specific gravity is very obvious. A chunk of gold weighs five times as much as a chunk of anything else. Also, the streak. Gold has a gold streak. Pyrite as a dark green streak. Easy. So unless you're a real fool, you're not going to mistake pyrite for gold. But there are a lot of real fools out.